You're listening to episode number 56 of the Keto Diet Podcast. Today, we're chatting about PCOS symptoms resolved with keto, overcoming weight gain with PCOS, carb ups and PCOS with insulin resistance, and so much more. So stay tuned. Hey, I'm Leanne from healthfulpursuit.com, and this is the Keto Diet Podcast, where we're busting through the restrictive mentality of a traditional ketogenic diet to uncover the life you crave. I've spent the last four months completely redoing my best-selling ketogenic program, The Keto Bundle. The Keto Bundle combines my two digital programs, The Keto Beginning and Fat Fueled, to provide you with clear step-by-step how-to on successfully adapting to a ketogenic diet avoiding common ketogenic struggles, and healing your body fully and completely with a ketogenic diet. And now it's even bigger and richer with 65 additional pages, beautifully designed graphics, fully re-edited text, and a whole new easy-to-use format. Some of the updates include... Boosted content for supporting beginners on overcoming challenges while adapting, including how to cut out grains, reduce carbohydrates, and ditching sugar for good. Guides on how to take action for gradual change when you're not motivated. Support for adapting to keto when there are digestive issues. Expand a chapter on healing your imbalances with keto from autoimmunity, adrenal dysfunction, neurological health, hormones, thyroid, candida, and so much more. A six-week and seven-day practice to body positivity and intuitive eating practices made to help you connect to your body. Metric and standard weights for all meal plans, shopping lists, and recipe ingredients as well as facts and outlines on current events affecting the ketogenic community and so much more. Head to healthfulpursuit.com forward slash bundle to get the keto bundle for 10% off with the coupon code podcast at checkout. This offer is only available to podcast listeners and will expire on October 31st. Again, that's healthfulpursuit.com forward slash bundle and the coupon code podcast for 10% off. Hey, happy Sunday. The show notes and full transcript for today's episode can be found at healthfulpursuit.com forward slash podcast forward slash E56. The transcript is added to the post about three to five days following the initial air date of this episode. And let's hear from one of our awesome partners. If you're not familiar with Paleo Valley, they make two of my very favorite things. The first, 100% grass-fed and finished fermented beef sticks. Each stick contains 1 billion probiotic CFUs to benefit the health of your gut and the strength of your immune system. Their gut-friendly sticks are gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, GMO-free, freaky chemical, additive dye, and preservative-free, as well as being 100% free from carbs and sugar and made with the highest quality ingredients. The second, a whole food-based, ultra-primal, super-nourishing organ complex. It's a mega nutrient-dense super supplement. The nutrients in just one daily dose read like the best multivitamin out there, and it's a whole food. Vitamins A, B2, B3, B5, B6, B9, B12, CoQ10, folic acid, iron, selenium, phosphorus, and zinc, copper, omega-3 fatty acids, DHEA, and EPA, phosphorus, the list goes on. Organ Complex is a combination of beef liver, heart, brain, and kidney, all sourced from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef organs, which are non-GMO and never given antibiotics, steroids, hormones, or grain. The capsules are 100% pure with no fillers or flow agents, gluten, grain, soy, or dairy. Now you can shop all things Paleo Valley, load up your cart, and apply a super sweet coupon code on everything in your cart. Take advantage of this offer by going to paleovalley.com slash keto20, fill up your cart, and enter the coupon code keto20, that's keto two zero at checkout to apply a 20% off discount on your entire purchase. Unsure of the link? Simply check out the show notes of today's episode to get all of the details.
If you have an idea for a podcast episode or want to submit praise over and above the review, which you can leave by going to healthfulpursuit.com forward slash review, you can reach me at info at keto diet podcast.com. And those reviews are really, really important. It helps more people find the show. It helps me rate better so that I'm a higher rating and I can just tell all my friends, Hey, I have a high rated podcast. I'm totally kidding. It's just so that more people can find the show. And the more reviews we have, the more it shows up in people's feeds. Okay, one announcement today, and it's a really exciting one. I mentioned a couple episodes before, and you probably heard it in the intro for today's episode. I spent the entire summer, well, mostly on a book tour and also renovating an RV and selling everything, but also redoing my two digital programs on keto, The Keto Beginning and Fat Fueled. I wrote The Keto Beginning back in 2014, Fat Fueled in 2015. They've become best-selling audiobooks and digital books and programs to guide you through adjusting to the ketogenic diet, specifically for a woman, written by a woman who's been keto for three years and struggled with a lot of things and have overcome it. And Fat Fueled is really focused on healing your body with a ketogenic diet and how to adjust it to work for you instead of against you. And I wrote these in a time where I was in the thick of it and a lot of things changed between 2014 and 2017. And I wanted to update them and also make them a lot prettier and add new things that I felt were missed in the originals while also coming up with new stuff that we haven't chatted about before. So I rearranged it, updated it, expanded it, made it gorgeous. And right now, all podcast listeners can get 10% off with the coupon code PODCAST, all in caps, no spaces, for the bundle at healthfulpursuit.com forward slash bundle. So if you've been thinking about getting the keto bundle or the keto beginning fat field combination, definitely head on over to healthfulpursuit.com forward slash bundle. Use that coupon code podcast for 10% off. I'm pretty sure you're going to love it. I put a lot of time and energy into making these even better than before. So I'm pretty stoked about it. Our guest today is Raynell. She's a freelance opera singer and aerial skills performer living in Fort Worth, Texas. She has suffered from skin and endocrine problems her entire life, culminating in PCOS, cystic acne, and weight gain when she had to go off hormone birth control in college. While initially following a paleo primal diet helped a great deal after years of experimentation and research, she found healthful pursuit. And Raynell says it has been the final bit of information that she needed to really be happy and healthy with her body. Raynell is a beautiful individual who shared a lot of great information about her PCOS experience. So if you have PCOS or you know somebody who has PCOS or just hormone dysregulation, Raynell is a very inspiring individual that I think you're really going to love. So without further ado, let's cut over to this interview. Hey, Raynell, how's it going? It's great. How are you doing? I'm so good and I'm so happy you're here today with us. Me too. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, yeah, you bet. So for listeners that may not be familiar with you, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Raynell Kraus, and I live in Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm an opera singer by trade. So I have my master's in music from Indiana University, and I'm also an aerialist. So I do aerial silks, and I'm working on fusion art right now, doing legitimate operatic singing while I'm up in the air, also doing a legitimate acrobatic routine. What? That is yeah. awesome. <laughs> How did you know? Okay, totally side question. How did you know that you were good at this? <laughs> <laughs> I've always sung. Uh, my parents have many, many embarrassing home videos of me singing as a child. And then with the aerial stuff, actually, I wasn't athletic as a child at all. Like, really not at all. <laughs> and about, I want to say four years ago, I did a, an opera training program out in L.A. And they recommended one of the instructors told us one weekend that we should go take an aerial class for fun. And I was like, yeah, OK, sure. And I didn't. And then she asked me on Monday and she was like, did you go? Did you have fun? I was like, no, I did my laundry and slept. Um, and she was like, well, you should go. And so I went the next weekend and had an amazing time. And the aerial instructor knew that we were all singers. They're just 
to have fun. And so at the end of the class, she tied a knot at the bottom of the silks. So you had kind of like a a loopy hammock type thing. And she had us lay back and invert. So we were upside down. And then she had us try singing. And so we went down the line one by one. And people either loved it or hated it. And I loved it. And I thought, you know, if there's any way that I could combine these, how amazing would that be? And, you know, how many different artistic collaborations could I do? And, you know, where would it be useful within the field of opera? So that's kind of how that got started. That is so cool. Wow. I always like to know how people find what they're good at when it's just not something you like learn in school, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you find keto? What was that process like? So about seven years ago, I was getting married and looking to lose weight, like I'm sure many people do. And I wasn't going to go crazy about it, but I really wasn't happy with my body. And so I started looking around online for different things. And I had remembered that a couple relatives of mine had done really well on Atkins. And so instead of going to the Atkins website or doing any of that, I actually got his book like from the 1970s (laughs) and read the original version of the diet, which was very ketogenic. And so that's kind of how I got started with that. And I lost a good bit of weight. And then the thing that really clicked for me was that I had been suffering from PCOS. You know, I wasn't getting regular menstrual cycles. I was getting them kind of, but not on any sort of a regular schedule. My skin was really bad. I had a little bit of hirsutism, not nearly to the degree that some women do, but enough to bother me. And I just wasn't very happy. And so about three months into a ketogenic eating style, my period was regular and my skin was clear. And I was like, oh, well, this is different. (laughs) Like this has never happened before in my life. And no doctor had ever been able to help me ever after, I mean, hundreds and thousands of dollars spent on skincare products and doctor's appointments and one thing after another. And all of a sudden here, things are sort of fixing themselves. And so then I got really into nutrition. I started reading the Mark's Daily Apple website and I started visiting nutrition forums and I started kind of really digging around in that corner of the internet as sort of a hobby, you know, while I was also in school getting my degrees and everything. It's like, but when I wanted some light reading, I would just go look at nutritional studies (laughs) or see what people on ketogenic forums were talking about. That's too fun. And so... How did you get diagnosed with your PCOS? What was that process like? Like that sounds like it was a long time before finding keto. Well, somewhat. It all kind of happened at once-ish. But I had a really good physician's assistant. And she was the one who actually mentioned it. She looked at the list of symptoms that I had going on. And actually, I had needed to have an ultrasound for an unrelated procedure. And she saw that my ovaries were like just covered in cysts, which that's not necessarily indicative of PCOS. There are plenty of women who have PCOS that do not have cystic ovaries, but some of us do. And mine were definitely there. And so she looked at that and she was like, hmm, you know, with all of these together, I'm betting that you might have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so she sent me to an endocrinologist who was less than helpful. (laughs) And he basically said, eh, it's kind of borderline. I don't really think you have it. And he kind of brushed me off with it. But I started reading and researching on my own. And by the time that I had another appointment with the physician's assistant, I had already adopted a ketogenic style of eating and many things had started to resolve themselves. And she was like, well, considering how well this is working for you, I would say that it does point to the fact that you most likely do have polycystic ovarian syndrome, but you're managing it very well. So what sort of symptoms, like you chatted about the acne, were there other symptoms that went away by eating keto that you experienced with PCOS that kind of were mitigated by eating this way? Well, I was able to lose weight, (laughs) which was great. Uh, Nothing really had helped before that. I mean, you know, in high school, I did like severe calorie restriction, which is not sustainable. And I felt like crap. And then I got to college and realized that I liked food. So I started eating again. And then I just, you know, I put on weight and I, I just couldn't shake it. And I was pretty active. You know, it's like walking across a college campus every day, toting loads of books. I was taking various martial arts classes and it just wasn't working and I couldn't figure it out. And so like the weight gain was a big, it was a big key to it, to noticing what was going on. And then also I like, I've always had really you know, severe acne. I've been on Accutane three times as a child and as a like an early teenager. And nothing had ever really fixed that before come to find out because of PCOS, you know, it's a hormonal root of the problem. And like good luck finding a dermatologist to agree that like hormones affect your skin. 
<laughs> oh yeah, no. For ten years, it was like diet and hormones don't really have anything to do with it. Here's another topical. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. I have been on Accutane twice, and it didn't help. It just made my skin really dry, and then when I went off of it, the acne came back. It's yep, yep. Nuts. Story of my life. <laughs> oh. So outside of a ketogenic diet, are there specific supplements that you take to help with PCOS, or do you find that? Because you eat keto, basically PCOS doesn't bother you. Or are there still things you deal with that are helped with supplements or whatnot? So I'm lucky that my case of PCOS wasn't really bad. It wasn't super stubborn. I mean, I, I do still deal with it in the fact that, you know, if I screw up my eating, it comes back to bite me like really quickly. So that's one thing that is sort of helps keep me on the straight and narrow is that my skin and my menstrual cycle will tell me pretty immediately if I've done something that is not great for my body. So I've got that, but I take a vitamin D supplement just, you know, I feel like most people don't get enough vitamin D anyway, but for me, it was incredibly helpful. I had some various like pH issues going on, like vaginal flora things that got totally resolved by just upping the amount of vitamin D in my diet and upping my leafy greens, which is very easy to do on keto. So that was nice. But other than that, I mean, like I, I've tried various other things. You know, I've looked at Dong Kai. I've looked at ashwagandha. I've looked at, you know, a bunch of other herbal supplements that are supposed to be good for PCOS, but nothing really made enough of a difference for me to stick with long term. I've noticed that the biggest thing that helps me is keeping my macros in line and, you know, eating really nutrient dense foods along with that. What are your favorite nutrient dense foods? Ooh, so I've been on a big sog paneer kick. Uh, it's a, basically like Indian cream spinach. You can make it with coconut milk if you're dairy free. I am really, really lucky that I can handle some types of dairy in certain amounts. Like I'm not going to eat yogurt for an entire day, but yogurt in small amounts doesn't bother me. So I'll add that to my cream spinach with like a whole bunch of really intense spices. I'm big into big flavors when I cook. In fact, I recently hosted a dinner party of all keto Moroccan food, which was really good and really easy. <laughs> that sounds delicious. <laughs> it went really well. Yeah, I did like a baked cauliflower rice. It's my favorite way to do cauliflower rice because it gets sort of toasted and a little nutty tasting. And then you can season it with garam masala and cardamom and whatever else you want to throw in there. But it's a really easy way to get that going. And it's wonderful for topping with curries or stews or whatever it is that you want. Oh, my gosh. I'm so hungry right now. Um, <laughs> I love that sort of food. More on my interview with Raynell Krause after this message from one of our podcast partners. The show is partnered with Good D's low carb keto baking mixes. Good D's makes muffin, blondie, chocolate brownie, chocolate chip cookie, and double chocolate chip cookie mixes completely free of sugar, sweetened with stevia. They're nut free, gluten free, and perfectly keto. Instead of the regular almond or coconut flour, their mixes are made with ground sunflower seeds. I know, it's crazy, and it's so good. Use the coupon code KETO, all in caps, no spaces, for 20% off your order at healthfulpursuit.com slash mix. Unsure of the link? Simply check out the show notes of today's episode to get all of the details. Okay, so we chatted a little bit about weight and how it was such a struggle for you before going keto. Now, do you find that with your PCOS being managed by a ketogenic diet that you're at a pretty comfortable weight for your body or are you still finding that there's challenges with that? Well, there are some challenges just because I am an aerialist. So it's like I'm surrounded by very tiny people with gymnastics backgrounds, which I did not have. You know, I've learned how to be an athlete as an adult. And because of that, I've, you know, I've had to deal with various injuries that come with getting older and not having as good of a athletic background as some of my colleagues do. And just my body type, you know, I don't have a traditional gymnastics or ballet body type. But I am at an absolutely perfectly healthy weight. You know, my cycle is very regular. The biggest change that I noticed actually when I found your work, because I had been looking around for a bunch of different things and I had been reading about the importance of carbohydrates for the athletic woman. And I was just starting to kind of look for women specific information just because I knew that it had such an effect on my body. And so I found your work and I gave it a shot for a month. I was like, all right, I'll try this carb up thing, I guess. You know, I don't feel great about it, but we'll see what happens. And I'd say within a month to two months, all of my PMS went away. I mean, all of it. And I had two weeks 
of miserable bloating and really painful breasts and cramps and mood swings. And it was it was really terrible. And actually, as an opera singer, that bloating goes into your vocal cords, too, makes it really difficult to sing, creates a change in the sound. And so having that reduced was amazing. I mean, from a life perspective, I mean, and my husband was much happier without the mood swings. <laughs> and uh, and especially from a career perspective that I have a more reliable, steady instrument. Totally. That is so cool. I didn't know that bloating like affects your singing. Yep, totally does. Actually, it affects a lot of athletic performance. It's not something that a lot of people think about, but any sort of athlete or I mean, and especially if you think about it, vocal cords, they're so tiny, <laughs> you know, it's like yes. when they when they swell up, you have serious issues. Huh. Very neat. Okay, so because of your experience with PCOS and kind of how you found it and you kind of, it's quite miraculous really that you were like, oh, PCOS, keto diet. Like you didn't struggle for many, many years trying to find like the best thing to do. But because you did a lot of research, I'm wondering if you dealt with hair loss or thinning or you know PCOS individuals that have dealt with that and kind of how that was mitigated or do you find like you don't even deal with that because you're on keto and everything's hunky-dory? Well, so the interesting thing is I had never really had much hair loss from my head. And then I started this ketogenic diet seven years ago and I went really hardcore. You know, I had a wedding to get ready for and I wanted to be pretty on my wedding day. And so I went really hard and it was working. And I was like, well, if it's working, I'll just keep going with it. And so I stayed on that pretty strict ketogenic diet, like really strict for maybe a year and a half. And then I got pretty thin to the point where my parents were like, are you okay? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm eating a ton of food. I feel great. My sleep is good. But little by little, I noticed that my hair was thinning out and my sleep wasn't so great and my PMS started to get bad. And so that was what initially started my sort of looking around for other dietary options. It's like, is keto the thing for me? And so I went off of a ketogenic diet for a while and sort of kept it like low carb paleo. And then I went like, you know, low-ish carb primal. And then I looked at Paul Jaminet's work with the perfect health diet. And he recommends like a much higher amount of starchy carbs for like mucosa health and for hydration and for digestion and all of this, you know, various types of insoluble fibers and how it's really healthy for you. And so I gave that a whirl and had a horrible time with it. It was really not okay. And I'm sure that it works really well for people who have normal hormonal responses to those kinds of foods, which is not me. And so that's when I sort of swung back and started thinking, well, maybe I should try ketogenic again, but yeah, I don't know. And a lot of things were sort of up in the air and I was okay, but I wasn't really happy with where my body was. And with the hair loss and thinning that kind of happened when you were doing the ketogenic diet the first time with more of a yes. restrictive mentality and now doing like you mentioned that you're doing carb ups would you say that outside of the carb ups you're kind of doing the same sort of keto or because it's so nutrient dense it's different than the first time you tried it I was doing pretty nutrient dense keto the first time around. Um, I got really, like I said, I got really into looking at nutrition blogs and I got really into the primal paleo side of things pretty early on. Uh, so that was nice. But no, I mean, just having carbo ups in my diet, I have found keeps my skin really nice and clear and keeps my hair like really nice and full. I have really good hair, <laughs> which is, which is nice. <laughs> totally. It is. It's the best thing. I love having a lot of hair. And when I went, you know, the first time kind of more of a restrictive mentality and not eating enough, I had crazy hair loss and that was not okay for me. Like I just, I love having thick hair. It's really great that we, you mentioned carb ups because a lot of the times people ask me, you know, on PCOS, because we have insulin resistance, should we be doing carb ups? And I'm always like, try it out. But if you don't feel good, then perhaps stop. So have you found that you're like, did you have any of the insulin resistant type of symptoms beforehand or not so much? When they were first diagnosing me with PCOS and I went to that endocrinologist, he ran a couple of insulin tests and basically it came back inconclusive. But there is a history of diabetes in my family. And I know that my mother, I believe, had been diagnosed as pre-diabetic at one point, uh, which she actually got back in hand with a low carb diet, which is great. Yes. But yeah, it's like, I never really got clear answers about it. The biggest thing that I saw was this connection to my skin, you know, so it's like, there's this whole cascade of hormones that results, you know, starting with a big, huge, like pump out of insulin, 
and then you get a bunch of free androgens in the system. And then especially if you're overly sensitive to them, that all comes right out in your skin. And so that was the biggest thing that I noticed in terms of trying to keep my blood sugar more steady and trying to avoid like major insulin swings was that I would either have clear skin or I wouldn't. Like I tried a uh, protein powder for a while. I was out on a gig living in a hotel. You know, I didn't have a kitchen. I had a microwave and I was trying to come up with easy ways to, you know, get decent food and not spend too much money. And I was like, oh, protein powder. I should totally do like some protein shakes. Uh, turns out that whey is highly insulinogenic, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I found out by having a horrific breakout, like all over my face and my chest and my shoulders. It was really bad. But uh, that was a light bulb moment also. Oh, geez. A lot of people don't know that it will spike insulin so much. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. So how do you think that PCOS relates to anxiety, depression, and mental health? Have you played around with that? Have you experienced that personally? I know that I'm asked that question quite constantly when it comes to PCOS. Right. Well, so... I mean, I've struggled with those things. I'm not sure how much of it is related to PCOS and how much of it was related to other factors. But, you know, the more that I read, especially these days, you know, they're thinking that a lot of depression is actually related to levels of inflammation in the body, which I think is really interesting. You know, it's like I, I'm not exactly a scientific expert on it, but there does seem to be a pretty strong correlation between the two. And you know, one of the markers of PCOS is inflammation. And then also just especially with the list of symptoms that PCOS comes with, you know, it's like really horrible, painful acne and hair loss in your head and hair sprouting in other places that you don't want it to be. And it's hard to lose weight. Like it's, you know, those seem to be like, that's a normal response to that set of very aggravating, frustrating symptoms that so many people have issues getting help with. So I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there's a correlation. I don't know how much causation is there personally, but yeah, that's basically been my experience dealing with it and reading about it. Mm, awesome. Cool. And okay, I forgot to ask a bunch of stuff about carb ups <laughs> because <laughs> it's very rare that I get to speak with somebody that has PCOS, that's using carb ups, that it's being beneficial because a lot of PCOS people are just super terrified of trying carb ups. So of course, yeah. Um, what do you eat first off when you do a carb up? That's my first question. <laughs> Well, if I'm being good, then it's sweet potato, <laughs> you know, or um, I mean, especially because I'm so active, like I have no problem eating a sweet potato with dinner a few nights a week. There was even a period of time that I was doing carb ups at dinner every night, as is shown, I, I think, in one of your books, you Fat have fuel. this like, yeah, the daily carb up recommendation. And so I tried that for a while. And, and it was great. I mean, like, and like I said, right now, I'm at a healthy weight. But being an aerialist and with shows coming up, I'm trying to get down to like, a really specific aesthetic, but also maintain my health. Like, you know, now that I've seen how nice it is to have a regular period without PMS and have nice clear skin and good thick hair, it's like, all right, well, I'll get down to a point, but I'm prioritizing my health and my mood and all of those kind of things over a particular body fat percentage. Like that's ridiculous. So um, yeah, typically sweet potatoes, since I travel so much, and I do end up eating out more often than I would like at times. Like I'll go to a sushi restaurant and I'll have a chirashi bowl, which is pretty much just raw fish and rice. And so, you know, I find that if I'm moderate in my rice consumption, that's not an issue. And yeah, basically starchy stuff. Sometimes I'll do fruit. Fruit doesn't really work really well for me, especially super sweet fruits like berries tend to be totally fine. I recently had a ton of watermelon because it's summer and it's delicious, <laughs> but I've been really careful to not go overboard with it. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like I can have a good sweet potato, but if I have a bowl of pineapple, game over. <laughs> like, yep. It's just, let's not even go there. Um, <laughs> that's really interesting. And so how often you kind of, that was my next question of how often you do it. And it sounds like you started off daily and now it sort of sounds like you do it a couple times a week. Currently, yeah, but that's always subject to change yeah. depending on how I feel and what's going on, how much training I'm doing, when I'm training. That's the one thing that I really like about your work, especially, is that, you know, you get into the, the keto sphere and with all of these fitness articles and people getting really intense about timing their workouts and their carb ups yes. around their workouts and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, my workouts are all over the place. Like, you know, I do some weightlifting. I do a lot of aerial classes, which is a ton of body weight work. I mean, you're basically just doing pull-ups like the entire class in addition to making art and also contorting your body and doing all this kind yeah. of stuff. But they could be at any time of the day. It depends on the day of the week, depends on the studio schedule. So instead of worrying about micromanaging that, I just try and eat 
you know, a, a decent diet. Like I'll start my day with a rocket fuel latte, or if I'm doing a morning workout, depending on how hard it is, like maybe I'll just have my rocket fuel latte and then I'll have a morning workout and then I'll have a lunch and then I'll have a dinner, maybe throw in a sweet potato with dinner. It just, you know, kind of depends on how I feel other days. I wake up and if I know it's going to be a really hard workout that morning, I'll have a breakfast, you know, nice and early, give myself some time to digest and then go hit the workout hard. It just, you know, it's what I like about it is that I can sort of play. It depends on so many different factors and it helps me not get bogged down and overwhelmed. Seriously, how much time did we used to spend on being bogged down and overwhelmed about all those rules and things? It's just too much time and energy. I mean, you'd probably have to miss an aerial class once a week just to calculate everything and make sure you're on point. <laughs> like, seriously. seriously, that is the one thing that I hate is logging yeah. anything. And I've done it because, you know, it at a certain point, it's important to know what you're consuming and you sort of what you're average breakdown looks like, but I can't do that long term. Like that's not, I don't even cook that way. It's like, you know, I'm going to cook a bunch at once and then I'm going to eat some. I'm not going to spend time measuring out exactly how much is in this bowl of whatever it is that I'm eating because I'm hungry. I'm just going to eat it. Yeah. It's too much energy. And you mentioned like how you feel and are there signs that you know that you need a carb up just intuitively? Like, can you put that into words? Some people can't, some people can. So I always like to ask, you mentioned like, when I feel like a carb up, I have one. But how do you, what does that feel like? Can you put that into words? Yeah, well, I guess mostly it just depends on what I'm doing in a week. So for instance, I've got a big aerial festival coming up. We're doing performances and then we're doing an entire week of workshops with guest instructors. So it's going to be a ton, a ton, a ton of energy for that whole week. And so in that time, just because I know I'm going to be gassed at the end of every day, I'll probably do a daily carb up just to help my body recover, help my muscles get ready to do even more work the next day, because I know this is going to be a week of solid work with not very much rest. If I'm not working so hard, then I'll usually scale it back to two or three times a week, just because I've found over time that's what works best for me. I find that with my skin, if I go too far with carb ups or I have them like way too often or with the wrong timing or whatever, it takes about a week for the breakout to show up. And then it's, it's pretty bad and really noticeable. So over time, as I've sort of stepped back and observed what goes on with that, it's like right now in terms of how I feel, you know, it's not that I, I guess it's not that I feel a certain way in my body. It's more that I half pay attention to when I'm eating carbs in my week and what my body feels like. So I aim for at least once a week, depending on what my goals are, you know, am I really trying to cut a lot of fat this week? Am I really trying to do, you know, whatever, you know, but at least one carb up just to maintain a uh, good adrenal health and, and sleep better. I notice that my sleep is better on my carb up nights and to keep my hair nice and thick and that kind of thing. And then I just, you know, I'll change it depending on my activity level. Amazing. Cool. That's awesome. More on my interview with Raynell Krause after this message from one of our podcast partners. A lot of us have a love-hate relationship with MCT oil. The reason why I don't totally love it anymore is that a lot of people are reacting to it in their gut. They'll add just even a teaspoon to their coffee and end up having a disaster pants situation. Or for others, it's just a matter of not having a blender on hand so you can never really add it to coffee or drinks without it getting everywhere or it leaving a film on the top of your coffee when you don't have a blender to blend it up. All of these things are just super annoying. That's why I stopped using MCT oil and And then I found a thing called MCT oil powder. And this stuff is amazing. You can add it to your coffee, just shake it up or stir it and it turns all creamy. You can add it to your favorite keto smoothies or recipes and it just makes things creamy and it incorporates so easily. It's not a mess, you can travel with it. It's amazing. But not all MCT oil powders are created equal. And I learned this firsthand when I was playing around with a bunch of MCT oil powder brands and they were spiking my blood sugar and I was like what gives. Turns out a lot of MCT oil powders use fillers like corn fiber, sunflower lecithin, maltodextrin, and sodium caseinate to cut costs. And all of these ingredients will end up spiking your blood sugar. 
My favorite MCT oil powder that I was able to find is from Perfect Keto, and they've put together a nice little coupon code for listeners that want to give it a try too. You can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash MCT and use the coupon code healthful, all in caps, no spaces, for 15% off your Perfect Keto MCT oil powder. If you're unsure of the link, simply check out the show notes of today's episode to get all of the details. Something that I found really interesting about PCOS is that it's one of the most common endocrine disorders, yet it receives less than 0.1% of funding from the National Institutes of Health, which is crazy to me. What do you think, like in your opinion, why don't more people know about PCOS? Because I know that, you know, as somebody who has thyroid dysfunction, I'm part of a lot of communities and we talk about these sorts of things. Why do you think people just don't care about this? (laughs) I think part of it is that a lot of the symptoms get minimized by the medical establishment. You know, I, it tends to be, I think that women have major issues with PCOS when they're trying to conceive and then it's, you know, quote unquote serious. Like now it's a serious problem as though it wasn't before when you were only dealing with debilitating cystic acne (laughs) and, and embarrassing hair loss and weight gain that won't budge. Like, are these not worthy things to be spending time on? And, you know, it's maybe that doctors look at the symptoms, you know, one at a time and it's like, oh, weight loss. Well, just eat less and exercise more and that'll take care of itself. Or, oh, it's just acne. I mean, how bad could it really be? It's like, yeah, it's not that bad compared to what I see on a daily basis, blah, blah, blah. And then there's also the fact that, you know, frankly, and this is a a major issue across the medical establishment, women's issues have traditionally been minimized, even in medical trials and in looking at, you know, new medications and research. It's like people, it's just been assumed that the female body will respond the same way that the male body does. And that's not true. I think finally, we're seeing a turning tide with that. And I'm very hopeful that more people will become aware of PCOS and how difficult it can be to live with and how difficult it can be to mitigate And hopefully, you know, the next five years, next 10 years, I think we'll see a big shift. I hope so, at least. Yeah, I I completely agree with you. And it was the same when I had amenorrhea, a lack of period. All doctors were like, "Uh, do you want babies? And I'm like, no. And they're like, so why does it matter? You don't have a period. That's so awesome. (laughs) It's like, (gasps) okay, cool. (laughs) Like, how do you even respond to that? It's just like, I think a lot of the times also with these sorts of things is people will think that there's a problem with their body or they're not feeling quite right. They go to a doctor, the doctor says, nah, you're fine. And then they are almost like embarrassed or ashamed to keep searching for the answer. So I think it's really cool that you kind of took some time, pulled together a bunch of resources and kind of just figured out what's PCOS and how do I manage this? Were there any resources specifically that during that time where you were kind of reading all about PCOS that you felt were pretty good PCOS resources? Uh, let me see. There was a f- there were a couple of forums that I frequented, um, and I didn't really post. I just lurked like, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I read a lot. I think it was what Soul Sisters was maybe one of the ones that I had looked up. Uh, but mostly, I just started looking at uh, nutritional studies. Anything that mentioned anything about insulin resistance or low carb diets or anything like that. That's was sort of my go to. Amazing. And we touched on this a little bit ago, but I always like to ask our guests that are talking more about like keto experience stuff, what you feel is missing in the keto space specifically for women. Well, so frankly, since finding your work, I haven't had a lot of reason to go into the keto sphere. I mean, I do occasionally I go, you know, I'll read things and I'll look at people's workout tips and, you know, but at this point I'm basically tweaking, you know, or recovering from a lack of willpower. Sometimes we just need a piece of cake and then I pay for it the next week and then I get back on my keto bandwagon and, you know, life goes on. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, in terms of things that are missing, I think still there's not enough widely accepted, hard, you know, peer reviewed sources on a ketogenic diet's effect on women and the hormones in various states, any states, (laughs) you know, it's like the ketogenic diet on its own is still somewhat controversial to the mainstream medical community. And then you add on top of that, this total dearth of women's issues in that, I mean, I'd say that is a pretty glaring absence, but there are people filling the gap, you know, 
is it happening quickly? No. Is it enough? I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it. Yeah. <laughs> but more, you've more. Got, but you've got people like you out there, you know, and it was a it was a huge eye opener for me to think, oh, my God, I can eat a ketogenic diet and still have carb ups. This is like the best of both worlds health wise, like everything that I've read about the importance of carbs. Now I have a way to include them in my diet. And then it made such a huge change, like really quickly. So it was just further confirmation. Oh, I'm so happy carb ups have been helpful for you. I know that when I started discovering the papers, very, probably the same things that you're reading of like carbs being beneficial. And then I was looking, well, what about this ketogenic diet thing? And they don't work hand in hand. And then I'm like, I'm just going to try this. I'm going to read a couple more things. And then it started working and with my clients. It started working. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I think I'm onto something. So it's been really, really cool to watch that process. So I'm really happy that you are feeling awesome on them and that you're also able to do it with people. PCOS, which I think even if, if those listening just hear that, like, yes, you know, Rennell has PCOS and she's doing carb ups, that's like a huge takeaway for this episode. And I love it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and everyone is different and everyone's PCOS is at a different stage. But you know, my is at this point, completely manageable through diet and exercise and exercise, frankly, is a lot more fun once you lose that initial weight that wouldn't budge. I mean, that was what got me active in the first place was that I started losing weight and then I felt better and was like, oh, maybe I could try exercising. <laughs> totally. I love it. And where can people find more from you? I have a website. It's just my name, com, And I'm on Facebook and I'm just sort of out and about constantly auditioning. I actually have my first like big aerial opera gig in New Orleans coming up next June, which I'm really excited about. It's a very sort of brand new thing that should be really exciting. I can't wait for it. But no, other than that, I'm just sort of around the country and auditioning and doing gigs here and there and doing my thing, trying to be as keto as I can on the road. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is like a whole other level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you tried MCT oil powder? I have not tried MCT oh my oil gosh. powder. I didn't even know that was a thing. I've got my MCT oil here at home. But yeah, no, no, I didn't no, 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 no. Okay. This is a traveler's tip because I've been on the road for like the last six months and you can't yeah. live on the road without MCT oil powder. So it's like MCT oil, but powder form and you can carry it with you because it's not going to spill everywhere and you can add it to your liquids and it just incorporates into your coffee or tea or whatever. Cause you know, when you like put oil in drinks when you're on the road and yeah, then you're it shaking top, it up forever gross. and it floats and yep. it's disgusting. <laughs> yeah. MCT oil powder just like mixes in like almost it's very similar to like the powdered coffee creamer, you know, like you just add it yeah. and then it makes things creamy and you're like, what magic is this? <laughs> Very similar, but it's just powdered MCT oil. There's nothing else in it. My favorite brand is Perfect Keto. They're great and they don't have any extra additive garbage maltodextrin and stuff. It's the best. And I could not, like, I don't know how I traveled without it until I had it on my first book tour and it was like, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> it's great. Yeah, that's amazing. I know what I'm going to be ordering as soon as I get off the yes. phone with you. Yes, <laughs> awesome. It's the best. So enjoy that. And yeah, it's yeah. I don't know how I did it without it. So I hope you like it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, no worries. So the show notes at full transcript for today's episode can be found at healthfulpursuit.com forward slash podcast forward slash E56. We'll have Raynell's website in there and a couple of things that she mentioned throughout the episode as well as myself. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Of course. No, oh my gosh. I mean, your work changed my life. So I was like, couldn't wait for the opportunity. Oh, that's so cool. I'm so thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. And that does it for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Thanks for listening in. You can follow me on Instagram by searching Healthful Pursuit, where you'll find daily keto eats and other fun things. And check out all of my keto supportive programs, bundles, guides, and other cool things over at healthfulpursuit.com forward slash shop. And I'll see you next Sunday. Bye.